Why, yes, I am alive. And back by no demand, thought I'll do some more teaching videos. Today, we are going over the Menai Standard Maths 2021 trial paper. A big thank you to my student, Tiffany, who meticulously screenshotted all the questions as she was sitting this exam remote. And I really appreciate it, not just to go over the exam with her, but to go over it with other people and now make a video for it. Uh, even as someone who does a lot of practice papers, this one really stood out as one of the best papers I've seen in recent years in its question design, so that um, it has a good coverage of all the topics you are supposed to know in uh, HSC standard maths. It's got good complexity in that the questions are hard, but they're not hard in terms of number crunching. Um, all the hard questions are hard because of the specific pieces of understanding they're trying to test you on. And some of them have some very tricky pitfalls. And I'm going to talk over some of that. So hopefully um, some people out there will find it useful, especially if you do standard maths. Uh, even if you do advanced, you might get some something out of this video because there is quite a bit of overlap between the standard syllabus and the advanced syllabus. You can just ignore anything that deals with uh, measurement and networks. Networks is the main one that is completely absent from advanced. All right, here we go. So, so I'm going to split this video into two parts to make sure it's not too long. So they will talk over all the multiple choice Oh, I actually meant to hide the answers and I forgot. <laughs> uh, one second. I am going to scroll down and hide the answers. Uh, um, okay, and then let's make it white. <laughs> All right. Uh, the level of preparation to this is amazing. All right, so today I'm going to, going to cover the advanced, oh, sorry, the multiple choice section of the standard Menai 2021 trial. And next video, I'll do the short answer. So all the ones that require working out to be shown rather than just selecting a letter of the alphabet. Here we go. Question one, starting off nice and easy just to get your brain warmed up. Samara's loan of $50,000 is charged at an interest of 4.6% per annum compounding monthly for 24 years. How many compounding periods make up her loan? Oh, so while you're hearing me work through this video, if you don't go to Menai, so if you haven't actually sat this exam, I highly recommend you pause the video and then do some working out on a sheet of paper, select your answer, and then unpause it to hear my explanations and the answers, even if it's super obvious, like this question number one here. So just a thing to look out for, which is normally when you see interest questions, students tend to jump straight for the formula sheet, and you know, the interest formulas are here. However, for this one, all they want is the compounding period, so don't really, you don't really need a formula sheet for that. So as you can see, I wrote here for Tiffany, which is question only asks for the compounding period. So it is 24 years, but compounded monthly. There are 12 months in a year, so just 24 times 12. Nice, easy one to get warmed up on. Next question. A 5 cent coin is weighed, weighed and measures 2.83 grams, correct to 2 dp. Between what two measurements could the actual weight lie? Like, uh, so if you do advanced, you can just ignore this. For the standard people, this is part of your measurement topic, and it goes into measurement error. So measurement error is the last digit of the measurement you are given are uh, halved. And what the last digit is worth, not the last actual digits. So I'll talk about the actual explanation. So the last digit in 2.83, which is the 0.83, like the three, is actually worth 0 0.01. Because that three here, oh, sorry, just give me a sec, I'll grab my zoom pen so I can draw some scribbles, uh, annotate, draw. All right, so this three here is uh, not, three as in you know three centimeters so this three of oh, sorry grams it's weights uh so this three is actually worth 0 0.03 right so if you're asking yourself like three what it's three lots of one tenth of a gram also one one hundredth of a gram it's in a hundredth place so the three here is worth 0 0.01 so when you work at the measurement error you halve the last what the last digit is worth so in this case if you halve 0 0.01 you get 0 0.005 and then this is the uh, error amount. So if you add it onto the actual measurement, you get the upper bound. And if you take it away from the measurement, you get the lower bound. So the answer is here. So when you add it onto the 0 0.835, just stick a five on the back. And when you take away, take that error. So this is the error amount. So when you take this error away from the 0 point, no, sorry, 2.83, you get 2.825. So that is that particular question. Should be halve with that. Uh, half is a noun and a half is a verb. All right, um, okay, moving on. 
So Christina is collecting data for an entomologist who is uh, someone who studies insects, not that you need to know that, who studies the ringlet butterfly. She catches a butterfly at random each week and measures, measures the diameter of the circular spot on the butterfly's wings. What type of variable data, what type of variable is the data she collects? So here, just think about what a measurement of a circular spot on a butterfly's wings is. So first of all, it's a number. So you can completely look past anything that says categorical. So categorical variables are things that go into categories. So if you were measuring the colors of the butterfly, so the butterfly is red, the butterfly is blue, those will be categorical. So uh, the number of how wide in diameter the wing is, is a number, so it's A or B. So you have to decide between continuous or discrete. Discrete are whole numbers. So shoe sizes are discrete, even though you can have eight and a half, but just discrete as in um, individual values that have nothing in between. And continuous means any value in between is valid. So here I have some explanation, which is, um, <laughs> sure, think about what numbers are possible uh, because spots on butterfly wings can be any number. So it doesn't have to be exactly three centimeters or exactly four centimeters, you know, it could be 3.4213. Uh, so it makes it continuous. And because it's a number, it's not categorical. So let's say, moving on. Uh, distance between two locations on the map is 2.5 centimeters. The actual length between these two locations is 36 kilometers. What is the re scale ratio for this map? So when you're doing scales, just like you're working with anything measurement related, you want the measurements to match. So the first one is centimeters and the next one is kilometers. So you want to change them to be the same thing. Uh, in this case, it will be easier to change them both into centimeters. As a general rule of thumb, when you're changing measurements, try to get bigger actual numbers to work with, which is usually the smaller measurement. So here, if, we ch if I change both of these into kilometers, 2.5 centimeters will be 0.000025. And you don't want zero point zeros and then two five. So if you change them into both kilometers, the 36 kilometers turns into like a huge centimeter number, but that's still preferable to a tiny decimal. So let's look at the working out. Uh, black. All right, so you can see the ratio is 2.5 to 36, and you turn both into kilometers. So here you can see 36. This is how much, um, how many meters there are. So you add three zeros to turn kilometers into meters. Kilo is a thousand, so you multiply by a thousand. Then you add two extra zeros to turn that meters into centimeters because there are 100 centimeters in a meter. So that's the number here. It's 3.6 million. So once the two numbers are matching in their measurement, you just bring it, bring the left side down to one. So it's kind of like algebra in this way. Whatever you do to the left side, you do to the right side. So getting 2.5 down to one requires you to divide it by 2.5. So you also divide the right hand side by 2.5. So you can jam this into your calculator and get 1.44 million, which is the uh, last option. I actually have the answer there. And so, oops, that's not how it's going. And so, D. All right. Moving on. Huh, there's a bit of highlighting here. All right, so two graphs are shown. Uh, and then they've graphed it for you, which is quite nice for this question. Because normally when you get two simultaneous equations, you get only the equations and you have to solve it algebraically. But here they gave you two equations, y equals 3x on 2 minus 2 and y equals negative x on 3 plus 5 on 3. And they've graphed it for you. So here, all you have to do is Look at the graph. So I have the, uh, so this is actually an extremely fast question to do. Just requires you to visually inspect the answer as opposed to uh, do algebra and derive it. So here you can see I wrote some notes for Tiffany. So normally for simultaneous equations, the way to solve them is you make them equal to each other. I actually quickly show you how to do that in a second. However, both of these have lines have been graphed for you already. So the solution is the point of intersection because this point exists on both lines. It exists on the line going up and it exists on the line going down. So it's a solution for both equations. So now all you need to do is look at it. So when we look at points, how far it goes left and right is the X value. How far it goes up and down is the Y value. It goes right two and up one. So it's got an X value of two, Y value of one, which makes it option A. So if you were to solve them algebraically, I'll just quickly show you just in case you need to do this for uh, some other exam somewhere else. So when you solve these, you just make the right halves equal to each other. So take the right halves of each equation and you make them equal to each other in uh, like in the algebra, so in an equation setup like this. So you go three x, oh, that's a two, I think, sorry. Three x on two minus two is equal to negative x over three plus five on three. So when you do this, um, ideally you want to get rid of the fractions first, which actually involves multiplying everything by six. So multiplying this by six, it actually becomes nine X. And then multiplying the two by six, you get minus 12. Multiplying the negative X over three by six, you get minus two X. 
and multiplying the five thirds by six, you get uh, 10. And now you have try to get all the x's to one side, which means adding two x onto both sides. So add two x over here, add two x over here. So you're gonna put 11x minus 12 is equal to 10. And then get this 12 over to the other side by adding 12 to both sides. So add 12 over here, add 12 over here. You end up with 11x is equal to 22. And uh, then divide both sides by 11, you get x equals two. And once you have x equals two, you can substitute these into either here or substitute it into here and you can get a y value. And again, it doesn't matter which equation you substitute it into. So once you have the x equals two, uh, pick one equation, substitute that in for the x and then you'll get the y value, which happens to be one and you get x equals two, y equals one. But you can see looking at the graph is a lot faster than doing all that algebra. All right, moving on. Oh, why did this not go? Oh, because it was a picture. So it says calculate the area of the triangle below. So this one just requires use of the formula sheet. So there is an entire section called trigonometry on your formula sheet. Every single capital A here actually refers to an angle A. However, there's one A that does not refer to an angle, that is this one here. A equals a half AB sine C. This A refers to area. And that is really, the, that's literally the only A that does not mean angle A. So you can see sine A is sine of angle A. Same as here. Um, yeah, anyway. Oh, by the way, in the trig section, all the uppercase letters are angles and all the lowercase letters are sides. So make a clear distinction on that in your mind. All right, so here's the working out for this particular one. Oh, oops. All right, so you, know, you can see I like to be very verbose in my explanations. In the trig section, only one formula deals with area, that is that one there. And then you just make the substitutions. So the little a and the little b are two sides and you only get given two sides. So it's very hard to substitute that wrong. And then the capital C is an angle. Again, all capital capital letters are angles and all small letters are sides. So you just make the substitutions, jamming in the calculator. Why does this, oh right, I see. There are more letters here. There we go, black. All right, answer is All right, moving on. Uh, Annabelle has a taxable income of 67,598. Throughout the last financial year, Annabelle paid uh, 14,220 in pay as you go tax. Given her tax payable is 12436.35 and the Medicare levy is charged at 2.5% 2, 2, 2 of taxable income, which of the following statement is correct? So it's either a tax debt, tax refund, neither, or not enough information. So uh, with tax questions like this, you just need to decide how much tax she owes and how much tax she actually paid. So the pay as you go tax is the how much she actually gave the tax office throughout the year, as you go, right? So on, on her, all her weekly paychecks, she was paying that tax as she goes. So she already gave the tax office 14220. So you just need to decide how much she owes the tax office. And let's see the steps in doing that. Right, so the medical levy is 2.5% of, so whenever in financial maths, when you see the word of, it's times. That's not an X, that's actually a times. So if you say, see 2.5% of something, it's 2.5% times that number. If you see a half of something, it will be a half times that number. Of means times. So 2.5% uh, of taxable income. So they tell you what the taxable income is. So you take your 2.5%, you put a time symbol, you put the taxable income. So uh, up here, 67598, and you get your answer. And then uh, that's how much, uh, so medical levy is also owed to the government. So that's how much she's supposed to pay. And then you add this to the tax payable. Again, payable means owed. So, but the medical levy is also owed. So she owes a certain amount of tax and she owes medical levy on top of that. So when you add these two numbers together, you get 14126.30, which is less than how much Annabelle actually gave to the tax office throughout the year in pay as you go. So, um, yeah, so she, she paid more than she, she was supposed to, so she gets a refund. Um, you know, $100 or so, which is pretty good. There we are. Make F the subject of the equation. So in this one, again, just algebraic rearrangement until you get F on its own. So yeah, I'll, I'll just if you do would like to try this yourself, just pause the video, look at the question, do some writing out on a piece of paper, and then I will show you the entire solution right here. All right, so first of all, you multiply both sides by G to get rid of the fraction. So then the G goes on the left. So now you end up with uh, GH is equal to two minus F squared. Um, ordinarily, you can just leave the F where it is, but I think most students prefer to work with positives. So I actually recommended Tiffany to add F squared onto both sides. So when you add F squared onto both sides, the uh, F squared disappears on the right where it's two minus F squared and it goes to the left. So you, because you've added to both sides. And now uh, you take GH away from both sides. So taking GH away from the left, this disappears. 
and taking GOH away from the right, you end up with two minus GH because before it was just two. And finally, you square root both sides. Now, there's actually a technical mistake here. When you square root both sides, the answer is actually supposed to be plus or minus uh, and then whatever the answer is. So for example, if you do the square root of four, the answer is not just two, it's plus or minus two because our, our negative two squared is also four. And then minus two times minus two is positive four. So when you square root, when you square root an answer, right, they're, they're supposed to have some plus or minuses here. So I guess a small mistake from the maths department of Meta in an otherwise excellent paper. So I don't want to you know, trash talk them because this entire paper is really well written. Um, anyway, that's the algebra. All right, networks. So uh, advanced people can tune out if you're somehow watching still. All right, network, they have some weighted edges and they have some vertices, A, B, C, D, E, F, H, G. <laughs> yeah, that's how the alphabet works. And then um, the specific question is, uh, someone is construct constructing a minimum spanning tree using Prim's algorithm. So Prim's algorithm is the better one, in my opinion, out of Prim's and Kruskal's, which are the two algorithm algorithms you learn in uh, standard maths. Kruskal's is the one where you have to sort all the edges by weight first, which is just a lot of work. So with Prim's, you pick any vertex or any point, and you just start building from there by selecting the smallest weights, and that's usually a lot faster. So here they have a partial, I really like the question design here. They have a partial Prim's algorithm. They're just asking you what the next step is. So uh, again, if you'd like to work this out, pause the video. But anyway, here's the solution. All right, so here uh, Prim's algorithm, algorithm focuses on vertices. So you can see A, B, G, F, H, and E are all connected. So we need to connect C or D. And the way you extend Prim's algorithm is you look at all the vertices that are currently connected then you pick the smallest number that you can do to connect the next one that is currently unconnected. So going from all the lines here, seven, two, six, and four, two is technically the smallest. However, we need to extend our existing uh, spanning tree. So you can't just pick the next smallest line. Uh, so we need the next smallest line that connects to something that's not yet connected. So here is to connect to D via this line that's weighted four. So why should you choose this line? Uh, well, yeah, that's D. Right, so um, yeah, that's about all the explanation for that one. Just pick the smallest edge uh, in weight that connects to your currently existing tree. All right, moving on. A biased 20 sided die with faces numbered 1 to 20 is twice as likely to land on the number 13 than any other face. How many times would you expect the number 13 to, to see the number 13 if the die is rolled 500 times? Okay, if you'd like to work this out yourself. And here's the solution. Uh, you want to, okay, so here's all. So it will be good to start with the regular chance for any other number that's not 13, right? Because the question does say twice as likely to land on the number 13 than any other face. So twice means double, right? But you can't really double something you don't have. So let's get a good base uh, starting point for any other number and then we can double that. So the regular chance for just a number to come up in a regular die on a 20, well, it's not, it's not that regular, it's got 20 faces. Actually, I have one of those in my pocket. I didn't even design that for this question, but I just happened to have one. Let me just grab that. So a this is called a D20, and the D20 looks like this. Oh, oh might not focus. Uh, there you go. You can see this die actually has 20 faces on it. It can land on any of the top faces numbered 1 to 20. All right, so anyway, just a random uh, interjection. All right, um, so anyway, for a regular chance for any other number will be 1, one in 20 or 1 20th chance. So in when you do... Um, probability maths, fractions are generally the way to go because the overall probability principle is uh, the desired results over the total outcomes. So that's a fraction. So generally try to express your probabilities in fractions if you can. And then so we have the regular chance, which is one over 20, so 1 20th, and then you double that chance. So 1 20th times, oh, oops, there's a typo here. That should be a two. Uh, 1 20th times two is 2 20th, which is 1 10th. And then you, that's the odds for the number 13. And then you take your chance and you multiply by your sample size and you get your expected outcomes. Again, that's a formula, I think. Is that on a formula sheet? It might not be. Uh, it's not. <laughs> the standard formula sheet is so sparse. It's just one page. For those of you who've seen the advanced formula sheet, you know how, you know how the, how little information this is by comparison. All right. Anyway, so, um, yeah. So just work out the chance for any other number, double it to get 13, multiply it to the number of times it's being rolled and that gets you the expected outcomes. All right. Moving on. There's um this, oh, by the way, this type of question, uh, I hope all of you can get better at because these are the kind of questions that Nessa is leaning towards, things that have real life relevance and things where the thing that you are supposed to do is not that obvious. So I really like this question design for question 11. So for question 11, 
uh, I'll put the questions on the right because it wouldn't fit uh, on this page of the document, but you can see what value would appear in cell E10. So E10 is, so you go to E, you go to 10. So it's the closing balance for June. So it's asking you to figure out actually what's happening like when you go left to right in the cells. So the opening balance just carries over from the last month, right? So if you can see that this 24714 carries over here, this 24427 carries over here. So the opening balance is just this number moved over here. So that's your opening balance. And then you need the interest. So with the interest, uh, you do the simple interest formula. However, you don't actually use this number as is because this is the per annum number. And clearly we are working out the interest month by month. So when you're working out the interest monthly, you don't actually use the yearly rate. You divide the yearly rate by 12. So I think at this point, I just showed it working out. So black, right. So you can see here, I took the yearly rate and I divided by 12 to get the new percentage for every month. And when you multiply that by the closing balance for May, you get, well, I wrote as a, just to let you remind Tiffany not to delete it from her calculator, but that gets you the, uh, so this actually goes in cell C10. Not that anyone's asking for it, but you know, this, this goes in cell C10. And then once you have that, so that's the interest for June. And once you have the interest, you have to actually realize uh, what's happening. So this is actually bad order. Let's do a left to right. So what's actually happening is you are adding on the interest and taking away the 400 because um, Haley is paying the 400 off her loan. So her loan amount goes up by the interest because the bank charges her interest. Then it goes down by the payment amount because Haley takes 400 of how much she owes. And that's how you get the final balance of 23267.75. And then that's option B, if you look above here. All right, moving on. Uh, so calculating the approximate error using two applications of the trapezoidal rule. So we kind of just broke this down into two, literally two applications. This is generally not how I like to do the trapezoidal rule because I mostly do the advanced. So in advance, I like to do H over two, and then first plus last plus two times all the middle and then close bracket here. Uh, but that will be you know, one application of the trapezoidal rule for any number of intervals. But anyway, literally just two trapeziums here, nice and easy, you know, no need to overcomplicate things. Uh, the only thing here, just remember to use the high, uh, 200 as the height value. I showed this exam to some of my advanced students, I'm not gonna call them out, but their first instinct was to do 400 over two, because they're, again, they're used to the height over two thing, but uh, you know who you are. <laughs> All right, so um, very easy mistake to make though, because the number you see on the exam page is 400. So it's, uh, it's very easy to go into, oh, I'll just write 400 down as the height, even if you realize that the height goes across here. So here, because there are two trapeziums, each individual trapezium actually only has a height of 200. Right? So 200 here, and then 200 here. So your heights are 200. That's really the only part where you can get the question wrong. Because uh, if you do 400 here and here, you will actually fall into one of the trap answers. You will actually get B. So part S and B is actually designed for you to make that mistake and then see it as one of the options and pick it. But if you do the trapezoidal rule perfectly, this is for the left trapezium. So the height is 200, height over two, multiplied to 240, which is the left side, plus 110, which is the right side. And then here it's 110 and 180. So get these two numbers, add them on, and then you'll get the, what's my answer? Oh, there we go, it's right here. It's all the way down the bottom, answer it. All right, next one. The radius of Jupiter is approximately, uh, so this one's a bit hard to see because uh, when Tiffany was screenshotting this, I guess it was near the top of the page. But uh, the radius of Jupiter is approximately 69911. So 69,911 kilometers express the radius in scientific notation. So scientific notation isn't like specifically covered or anything, but it's still, it's still something you are expected to know. So uh, again, I'll pause the video if you want to think about it yourself. And here's the answer. Uh, if I can highlight it properly, here we go. I read a lot of words for this one. All right, so, so when we're talking about significant figures, you start from the left. Actually, I should have written that. So start from left, stop at two numbers. All right, start from the left, use some proper grammar. Um, so whereas decimal places starts at the decimal place, the, des the decimal point, significant figures just start all the way from the left of the number. So we want two significant figures, and you ignore any leading zeros, but this number doesn't have any, so it's all good. So you start from the left, you stop at two numbers, so you get six, nine, something, something, something. And then you still apply normal rounding rules. So even though it's significant figures, it's not like you can just write the first two numbers and just like forget the rest even exist. So you still need to apply it so you can look at the number after where you stop. So you're gonna look at the number after the nine you stopped at, and the number after that is yet another nine. So nine is five or more, so you actually need to round up. So the 69 goes to 70. And then once you get 70, we actually write it as um, a one decimal place number. So 70 becomes 7.0. 
by the way, when you figure this out, there's only one answer with 7.0, so you can just select that answer. But anyway, the proper way you do it is you write your 7.0 and you check how many times the decimal place has to move to become the original number. So when you get 7.0, so I'll write this out. So when you get your 7.0, you have to move the decimal place four times, right? So once, twice, three times, four times over here, and you're filling all the middle zeros, and you get 70,000 point nothing which is the rounded version of 69,911. So because the des decimal place moves four times, that four goes into the index section of times 10 to the whatever. Uh, this is a very unusual question because normally when you do multiple choice and where three of the answers look similar and one of them looks different, the different one is like the odd man out is like wrong, but this is the this is the choice where the different one is the only correct answer. I mean, yeah, there's only one correct answer, obviously. Moving on, um, blood alcohol, I might just skip this one. So if you want to look at the solution, you can just, uh, pause the screen. Again, there's, there's nothing too bad with this one. So I'll just put the answer on the screen. It's just a matter of substitution. So they gave you the formula, 10 times n minus 7.5 times h over 6.0 a.m. So uh, thanks to my other student, Dion, for supplying, supplying this one, because I ran through the meta paper with him as well. And he actually typed this out for me with some beautiful, let's define n and h and m before we substitute it. So that's very clear thinking on Dion's behalf. Good job, buddy. All right, so get all the numbers. Uh, the only key thing here is like the number for n is not immediately obvious because you can see here, he consumes five drinks. So normally you might be like, oh, I just shoved the five into the number of drinks, but each of them is um, 1.8 standard drinks. So you want, you want to actually figure out how many standard drinks that works out to be before you substitute it. So in this case, it works out to be nine standard drinks. And then you substitute into the N. And yeah, the rest, you just do some maths. So between 9.40 and 11.40 is two hours. So H is two. And then the mass, they tell you how much Raul weighs. And it's uh, 78. So main quarter substitutions, Germany in the calculator, and you get 0 0.1414. And you just pick the closest answer because they've rounded it. All right. Uh, and lucky last. So today, I'm only going over the multiple choice in part two of this video. I'll be going over the long response, which I actually already have the answers for. But they are currently hidden. So you can see there are S's here, right? So there are S's there. All right, anyway, uh, for the last question of the multiple choice, consider the following distribution. Now, this is not that obvious at all. So normally when they give you a question like this, they simply ask you, is it left skewed or is it right skewed? So spoiler alert, this is uh, right skewed. You can see here on the picture on the right. So let's have a, actually talk about how you can work this out. So um, I think when I was showing this to my students, they were actually tossing up between A and C, which will be good instincts. Because A is the mode. Mode means most frequent, so or most common. So that kind of works with this graph, right? Most common, you just pick the highest frequency. So you know the mode, or you can probably got the answer spoiled from my little diagrams on the right. But so anyway, so when you know the mode is going to be the highest point on the frequency, and it's pretty far to the left, you know? So like the mean and the medium are somewhere here. So the mode's probably the smallest. So I think most students got to that point like fine on their own. So that, okay, I want A or C, I want mode is less than, and then I want to decide if like the average is smaller than the median or the median is smaller than the average. So I'll show you the actual answer. So the answer is C, but let's talk about why. So here. All right. Um, so I found I just found these nice summaries on the internet, so I just pasted it in here. So maybe you like to hard memorize these, but I think um just knowing the reason probably is probably better for most people. So I'll tell you the reason. So the median is the middle score. So if you, if you imagine this whole this whole graph as a piece of string and I stretched it out straight. Actually, I might have something to do help with that in my pockets. My pockets are many things. Sorry, here we go. I got, I got, an, I got an aux cable, so we'll use that. All right, so, okay. So have a look at the uh, tiny little portrait of mine in the corner there, I hope you can still see it. So in this graph, it currently looks like, oh, this is not really working as well as I thought it would. Hold on, like this maybe? Okay, so you ma imagine this is the graph. So imagine if I just pull it straight, so that the graph is now one long line. Uh, so the median will be the exact middle point of that piece of string. So again, it requires a bit of visual estimation. So we already considered this as the mode. So when you pull the when you pull this line straight, the median will be like about here. Again, it just requires a bit of like visualization. And then with the mean, because this is so exaggerated, like you can see the frequency, like um the low score um got actually yeah I don't so there's um. Well, so the mean actually means you actually add up the values for all the things and then take the average. So once you do that, because this is right skewed, the, the mean skews high. So like skews to the right. So when, because um, 
when you look at left skewed and right skewed, I always got quite confused by those words because you know left skewed actually like I always look at the fat bit, right? So with, with a left skewed graph, I'm like, oh, the big bit is to the right. Why is this called left skewed? And then I had to force myself to remember that skewed talks about the tail, right? So left skewed means tail points to the left, and right skewed means tail points to the right. But yeah, so um here. Try to create that mental association of the skew actually affects the average as well. So if it's right skewed, means the average skews towards the high end. So that puts it to the right of the median. And that's part of the definition of right skewed. So mode, median, sorry, median. I don't know why I'm writing this even though the graph is right here. <laughs> median, uh, median and mean. So mean is average. Um, so in this case, once you decided the where each of them should roughly be on the line, then you can select the correct relationship. So mode is the smallest. Oh, so the answer is C. Mode is the smallest, which is less than the median, which is less than the mean. All right, that's about it. So that is the first half of the Menard 2021 Standard Math Trial paper. It's a very good paper. You'll see, you'll see more clear examples of why this paper was so well written in the second half, in the long response section, because some of those questions are extremely well designed. So I'll be going through that uh, next video. And between now and the HSC, um, I feel like I'm going to run a uh, sort of exam run through service. So I, I imagine a lot of my E12s will be currently um, going through a lot of practice papers. So if you come across a particularly good one, please feel free to forward it to me or just bring it up when you get into a tutor, one of our tutoring sessions. And if I like it, I might do a run through of it so that uh, even if I go through it with you, you might like to have a video form so you can look at it later, like listen back to some of the parts, you know, my super fast talking kind of glossed over, or maybe some other people might find it handy. So um, mainly I'm interested in English or math. So even if you have, if you find an English paper that you think is interesting, uh, feel free to raise that with me as well. And maybe I can talk about some of the uh, approaches to the short answer or maybe what you think about for some of the essay questions. So yeah, for any HSC students out there, mine, really, uh, you bring, bring up any kind of tricky papers you find in your studies and preparations. And I'll be more than happy to go through it as part of my Tuesday teaching series. It saves me having to come up with my own ideas. All right, so thanks for everyone for watching. And I'll see you in the next video. Until then, hold on, I'll put my finger over the stuff recording button and stuff. Uh, here we go. All right. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, hopefully this was useful to you. I'll see you in the next video. Until then, keep learning and take care.